and welcome everyone to our second Beginning Writers Workshop. Uh, my name is Michael Watson. I'm your host for the evening. I'll be guiding our conversation along and talking with our excellent panel of writers tonight as we go over some excellent writing tips and discuss a lot of the ins and outs of what it is to be a writer. So we're joined by four writers today, and I'm going to have each one of them introduce, ourse introduce themselves, and we can go from top down. Uh, why don't you just tell us a little bit about who you are um, and what you do in writing and how you also got started in writing as well. Okay. Uh, my name is Michael Lindley. Um, I am a, a podcaster and a comic book writer. Um, I, I founded uh, Omen Comics and Revelation Comics. We got about 11 comics out right now. Um, I, I actually started, um, I wrote my first comic, I believe, when I was 12 years old. Um, it was extremely derivative. Um, mm -hmm. It was basically a Casey Jones Punisher kind of a mm -hmm. thing, uh, mm -hmm. except on a Harley. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that, that was an interesting thing. I, I wrote a few more back then, but I mean, obviously, I had no idea what I was doing, and, and I, I was deriving a lot of it. So, so um, it, was, anyway, it was Casey uh, Jones and Punisher and Ghost Rider? Kind of, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, in fact, speaking of Ghost Rider, I wrote a sequel to Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, inspired by Ghost Rider. But um, <laughs> uh, I, 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 uh, when I was in my uh, like uh, mid, I want to say mid twenties, um, I started writing uh, a prose novel, uh, the McFear Family Chronicles. It was uh, uh, inspired by my love of Tolkien. It was just a big fantasy novel. Um, but that, that didn't really, I, I, I just didn't really feel like, uh, it was a comfortable zone for me. And, um, it was, it wasn't until uh, a few years later, I started uh, a Chico comics page, which we reviewed comics and interviewed artists and stuff like that. And, um, I, I really started learning, picking up things about the craft of writing comics by talking to other, uh, uh comic creators and, and by reviewing the comics and stuff. And pretty soon I decided I wanted to do that myself. Um, I uh, uh, it, it I, I got involved with a, with a guy who was gonna gonna publish some works and stuff and that didn't really work out but I decided I, I still wanted to make comics and uh, do it I'd do it myself and so that's when I started uh, Omen Comics. Um, well, just getting into the the writing of comics, I just I really enjoyed the medium itself. I I, don't, I, I can't describe it really. I, I, it's nothing compared to prose, in my opinion. I, I just really love, you know, describing the panels and and how the uh, just the control mm -hmm. of the page and, mm -hmm. and all that's going on like that. I I I just really enjoy writing comics. Hmm, that's fascinating, man. Well, excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us on tonight's panel. I appreciate that. Hey, no problem. And then we have Michael, or rather Matt. I'm Michael. Uh, <laughs> Got to get my own name right. Man, that's so hard these days. If you're introducing <laughs> yourself in the second person, that's not good, man. <laughs> yeah, I think you might need to get some help. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Anyway. I always, I always loved it when Bob Dole did that. <laughs> hey, see, I'm just, I'm just copying the greats, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Well, being Paul doesn't really make you great, so. <laughs> well, anyway, political joke aside, I'm Matt Trin. I'm a I'm a writer for Wicked Publishing. I created Mechanic Chronicles, and as well as Mythics for Mythic First Publishing. I got into writing. When I was much younger, because I was bored in class. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds relatable. Thank you. Yep. A lot more productive than what I did. I just cut school. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I come from an Asian family, so if I were to cut school, that, uh, that would be wow. end of it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that could go badly yes <laughs> and so how did you after you you know obviously were bored in class how, where did it come into you actually wanting to create your own stories and 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 to go from there into comics and stuff like that well it was back when i remember clearly it was because it was math and i hated math 
So here I am. Goes back to math. It all comes back to the math class. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and comics I decided to do in my early 20s because it seemed like it seemed a lot rather interesting to build a script as opposed to, let's say, prose. Prose. You have you do have your own styles, but it's more loose form, while scripts are more structured, kind of in a way like an engineering project. Okay. I mean, there's a lot of math that's involved in in writing comics. That's true. Panel, uh, yeah, like panel how, count. How many pages? Count. How many panels? You know. That yeah, kind of <laughs> that makes a lot of sense, actually. Yeah. Figure out how I uh, figure out what you need here, here, and here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's your chemistry right there. You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and figure and, and the more you do it, figure out how you can cheat. <laughs> yep. Like, what can I what can I leave out that I thought I was going to have to put in, but I actually don't. <laughs> did, did, did any of you guys experience this? When, when I was a kid, I actually learned a lot of vocabulary reading comics. And it wasn't huh. until later, it wasn't until later, because that, that I figured out why. Um, the, you, you, you're usually typically limited to a certain amount of words per balloon. And so they had to be creative. They couldn't, like, elaborate on a long sentence. They had to use big words that meant the, the same thing uh, to, co to counter up the, the space like that. And I was just wondering if any of you guys, if that if that happened to any of you guys, or <laughs> I, I I have a friend of mine who's a big comic book mm. fan, and he won a spelling bee, and he attributed it to the to Stan Lee's use of those sorts of exactly. words. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But he he, did, he didn't think he he thought that it was that it wasn't a space thing. He thought it was that um that's just something Stan Lee kind of enjoyed. <laughs> What's well, it's funny that you mentioned you unlocked a memory for me. I, I I was like, I don't think that's true for me. I was like, no way, it, it was. I used to read Calvin and Hobbes as a kid, and that they used to, he used tons of big words in that. I always had looked them up and be like, what does this word mean? What does this one right? mean? Right, right. It yeah. inspires you to want to know what they're saying, right? That's true. Yeah. 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 That is interesting. <laughs> well, excellent. Well, thank uh, and and Mike or um, Matt. I keep doing it. Why? I'm, I'm have to keep talking. It. I'm so used to talking to Mike here. Uh, and so Matt, Matt, of course, uh, is a talented writer. Has, uh, as you mentioned, many comics out there with many more yeah. in the way. So really happy to have you on the panel with us. My, nick my nickname from now on will be Mike. <laughs> that won't be confusing at all. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast of Mike, Mike, and Mike. <laughs> three Mikes. Uh, I, I, we have to. We'd have to go recruit three Ikes. <laughs> <laughs> And then next up, uh, we have Nika. Hello. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Nika. Uh, I'm formerly Nana Hoshiko. I have released uh, two comics that were my own, which is starring here at Wicked. And I've been a Wicked creator for about four years now. They're my favorite guys ever. Aww. <laughs> um, and I have my second comic, um, Swevin, which is published with INKR Comics, um, which is basically a the current online comic. I don't even know how to word it. <laughs> they're just massive. they're ever evolving, you know. They, yeah, they're, uh, yeah. you know. Um, they, are, they are a comic platform, uh, in uh, essence, I believe. Yeah, they are a comic platform, a digital, digital comic platform. Mm -hmm. um, and they were formerly Manga Rock back in the day. Um, a lot of people remember them as uh, Manga Rock. Um, and, and originally, I was just a, a writer. Um, but in the past two years, I have practiced illustration. So now I am illustrating and writing um my own comics which is something i'm super proud of because <laughs> it's been really cool, yeah. yeah it's been um a ride um, <laughs> I, 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 yeah. I have a question for you uh with you doing sure. the art and the writing uh how, how, does that does that slim your scripts down some being that you don't you're not having to explain your stuff to an artist where you can just say well you know that thing you were thinking of i'm gonna do that and then um <laughs> like i mean how, how does the script writing go like that 
I definitely feel like I have um, created a unique writing process when it comes to um, illustrating my own comics now. And honestly, to tell you the truth, it's it's not much different. Um, I still perform the same way um, in, in describing because I also work alongside um, a co-writer too. Um, you know, that really oh, helps yeah. me. Yeah, he is my, well, he likes to say he's my editor, which uh-huh. he does... Uh, frazzle dazzle if you will um but i do feel like um even even doing the own art i still feel like i haven't uh changed how i write the script or trimming them down necessarily but i definitely feel like i have a lot more creative freedom yeah that's cool yeah um and and so my comic Swevin that is released with I and KR um will be the first comic that I illustrate. I'm also um thinking and talking about probably illustrating um the next starring episode as well. Uh which is actually really cool. I'm not even gonna lie, illustrating them characters has been really fun. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. Because yeah. mm-hmm. that was your like original story that you in world you came up with before. Yes. Season, so. Yeah. And I've been writing um since I can hold a pencil. Um mm-hmm. ever, like ever since I was a little kid. Um my mom used to tell me that I would play by myself and make up stories with my toys and my toys <laughs> would talk back and forth and I went to school for writing and later on, you know, after um, I had my son, you know, I was a stay at home mom. So I was like, you know, super bored sometimes. And I just started creating like little fan fictions and then it evolved. And here we are. <laughs> here That's we are. Awesome. Yeah. I actually created a whole Pokemon universe. <laughs> oh my God. That's a, yeah. That well, sounds you, like you got to catch them all. <laughs> yeah. I created like, uh, <laughs> I remember that in my fan fiction short story that I was writing, um, I had a Tokopi Island. Mm, interesting. They are, they are yeah. one of the cutest ones. So I know. Yeah, that's fair. Tokopi that Island. Is, you know, all <laughs> out. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, starring, starring is incredibly special to me. Um, and it, hmm. it really, you know, looking at it now, I used to just think how amazing it was to illustrate, like, all these illustrators and what they do. And now I can do it myself. Oh, I'm sorry. I have feed. I'm outside. That's okay. No worries. It's not yeah. too bad. But um, um, it ain't nothing. Yeah. Good. Good. So and but yeah. Well, I, excellent. Yeah, yeah, we're really excited to have you with us here tonight. And and you know, I can really switch my writing styles quite a bit. Um, Starring's mm-hmm. kind of like your fantasy, but um, Swevin's a little bit more serious and adult themed. Yeah, and well, and maybe uh, you can also, as since you're now doing the art yourself, you'll be able to uh, you know provide some ins- insight into. the that angle as well in addition to writing too yes um last yeah. summer uh i took a um workshop with um a japanese sensei so i really learned a lot mm. about paneling in that class yeah oh, and wow. i'm i'm willing to share it here tonight for sure cool. wait awesome what, what do you mean by sensei um i basically i took like a a workshop with a illustrator from japan oh okay got it mm-hmm. I call I mean, him. We always called him Sensei. <laughs> okay, no, I was just like. It's kind of like when you're in martial arts and you call him. You have to call him Sensei. No, I understand. Know? That's what I I was thinking <laughs> in the martial arts context, and I'm like, yeah, so you no, can break, I get it. You can break boards and split panels exactly right now. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It's a very. It's a, uh, the martial arts of comic creating. Yeah. <laughs> um, my my grandmother was Japanese, so um, I can understand a lot of the language. Mm. I speak. He spoke English for a majority of the class, but. Um, you know, he did explain some things and it was cool. Did he swear in Japanese? <laughs> I'm sorry? Did he swear in Japanese? Sometimes, yes. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, yes, uh, thank you again for joining us tonight. And then we also have with us Jeremy as well. Hi. Um, I'm Jeremy Lott. Uh, for for Wicked, I uh, wrote and and uh, Doug Curtis uh, arted, and we published uh, Movie Man number one. We have number two uh, done, but it's in kind of production hell that I don't want to go into right now. <laughs> um, uh, and I have literally seven other comic books from different series that are all the art is done at the very least. Um, 
And so at some point we'll do something with those. Um, but I have taken a detour um, and have been working on kids books. Uh, and over the last few months, I've, we've published two uh, Amazon print on demand. This here is the three feral pigs and the vegan wolf. So, um, and it's, uh, you know, it's the, the series that it's part of is called Fantastic Fables. And you can see the cover of the first book here on the back of it called Growly Locks and the Three Humans. Um, the next volume is going to be um, The Trouble with Golden Eggs. And the fourth volume, uh, and that'll be it for the first round of the series, will be um, The Tortoise and the Dare. So, nice. <laughs> and, you know, obviously I'm just taking and playing with fables right mm -hmm. now. And of not all of them are Aesopian, but enough of them are mm -hmm. that I, that, you know, uh, literally I, there's a teacher in the fourth volume that's named Mr. Aesop. <laughs> so, nice. um, you gotta but, give respect to yeah. you know, where, the, where you're coming from there. Yeah. And, and, and then there's like, I'm going to go in different directions in the future. And so okay. I wrote one story that, that I don't actually think is a kid's story. Um, <laughs> but I mean, it's not like mature. It's just, it's very, the, the way it references things and whatnot. It's like, no, that's not a kid's book um, that is set in Magoo's middle school. So I'll have to figure out what to do with that at some point. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, I've just, I've switched to children's books uh, because there is a developed market for that uh, in the print on demand space. And uh, I don't also I convinced my wife to actually, uh, you know, get into helping me publish that. And, um, you know, she's we the the company that will will eventually form is going to be called Lot's Wife Books. And yes, we are using mm -hmm. a, a salt shaker uh, as, as the <laughs> logo. So, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, before that, uh, I've, you know, written and published books through traditional publishers. Um, I've been in the word business for, I don't want to name the number of years, so let's not do that. It's a long time now. Um, and that's my, my day job, uh, that I've, you know, what, I, what people ask me, what, what do you do? And wherever I am, I just say, I write, I edit, I scheme. Um, and, uh, that I say, but not in a bad way. <laughs> um and uh so that's uh that's me i also occasionally do stand-up comedy though i haven't done it for a while so hmm. i think that you're you're probably hearing me uh try out jokes here tonight that i, <laughs> I should be trying out on stage that's not your five minute but, yeah stand -up, right that's right <laughs> nice <laughs> so um nice, i've nice written part. almost any genre of writing you could think of i've at least tried mm -hmm. um like I haven't tried romance, okay, but um, <laughs> you know, uh, but yeah. Has, really, let's be honest. Yeah, well, there is that. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so that's that's me. So there you nice. Go. Well, excellent. I'm I'm really happy to have you with us tonight to talk about the art of writing and the craft of writing. Happy to be here. Excellent. Yeah, well, I'm a cool. horror writer. If I did a romance, uh, the boyfriend would be a serial killer. <laughs> And yeah. the the and the fe er, excuse me the um the female protagonist would be the final girl, but wouldn't it be like? Right. But I, I I thought it'd be like Mr. and Mrs. Smith, where it turns out they're they're both serial killers, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah, that works. That could that's it. Actually, I'm, would be a good I'm, twist, I'm, you know. I'm actually in. I would be influenced by a book I read called Romeo, where a guy would uh, start dating a woman, and then when they finally were going to have sex that, that, that night when that was supposed to happen, he yeah. would carve out their heart and oh. put in, in place of their heart the heart of his previous victim. That sounds I mean, pretty sadistic. <laughs> at, at, at least he was into recycling. <laughs> <laughs> Waste not, one not, after, after they always say. <laughs> um, but yeah, that Michael is, uh, as we like to call him around here, uh, uh, Macabre Michael. That's right, Macabre yeah. Michael Nunley. Yeah. Yes. That, I one, know. Speaking of difficult words, that was always a hard word for me when I was growing up. I always well, say macabre because of the way uh, it's spelled. Yeah, know? yeah, totally. Right. <laughs> I think it's French, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. Okay. They say yeah. it in one of the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. So I remember that. It's macabre. <laughs> Uh, well, yes, uh, we're here tonight to discuss the, the as I said, the art of writing. Uh, we've gathered here a great panel of writers that we just introduced, and we're going to talk about different writing techniques and, and, get, and give out their best advice. And so I've, to, to do so, I have some questions that I've uh, come up with ahead of time to try and, and generate some interesting conversations. They'll, they'll, they'll be jumping off points. 
and hopefully can can not only generate some great conversation, but even lead to other conversations. And every single so often, I'll go ahead and chime in with a new prompt just to keep the conversation going and keep things moving. Okay. Sounds great. So I have one here ready to go. Uh, our first one, I just want to start, start off simple, you know, make it easy for everybody. Uh, what are the most important things for beginning writers to focus on? talking about creation process the whole thing or i think um be patient with yourself is a pretty good answer to that one um because when you're a beginner writer um you're gonna go through a lot of things that don't sound good in about three to four years <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that's so just, true uh that's just developing um, and your first script's not going to be your best. And honestly, you just, it's like a muscle. You must grow it. Um, and you're going to throw things away. You're going to throw ideas away. So don't let that discourage you and think that you're not a writer. Um, be patient with yourself. Makes sense. Um, yeah. I, 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 I need a little clarification here. Hmm. We're talking about uh, once you have the story in your head, or are we talking about creating the thing from the beginning? I believe so. in this case, in the context of this question, it would be in terms of more, more less about the story itself and more in terms of the maybe um, execution. You know, execution. That's thank you. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. yeah. What are some of the things like when you're when a beginning writer is first starting on that they should focus on? Uh, you know, whether it be the story or the grammar, for example, just to yeah. get out it. I mean, one thing that I would say is don't don't think that your your first draft is your final draft. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, like it should like I mean to give you an example, um, I was having a really hard time writing my first book, uh, and so I finally uh, this this was not a this was a, a nonfiction book, but still, um, and so finally I because I, I was just getting too much in my head, and so I finally went to a bar, and I started writing after I had a couple drinks in me. And um, then I just had to focus like crazy on just the thing in front of me rather mm. than anything else. And yeah, the spelling was awful, um, <laughs> you know, but I could fix that afterwards, you know, but I needed, I, it, I could edit things, I could fix them, but I needed something out there in the first place. So the point is get something out there and don't, and don't feel bad when you have to change it a lot. That's fine. Uh -huh. hmm. um, Interesting. Okay. I, I would I would go as far as uh, my writing professor uh, told me that um, doing multiple drafts uh, does not mean that you're a bad writer or that there's something wrong. In fact, what it means is that you're putting more thought in it. And the more thought you put into it, the more thought your readers can get out of it. Yeah, and I think that there's like mentally too, there are different things, the way your brain processes these things. There's the getting it out part, which is probably – for a lot of us, it's the hardest. It's not everyone. But um, and then there's the okay. Once you have something, rearranging it, tinkering with it, and, and those are just different mental processes. Mm. And I th I I think I think generally that tinkering, as long as you don't get discouraged, is easier than getting it out there. I I in terms of execution. Oh well, now that you say that, <laughs> my answer feels. <laughs> Because I was like thinking like as a beginner writer, I just wish I would have been patient with myself. But if we're talking about the process, um, I definitely am, uh, you know, everyone has a different style of writing. And I feel like trying to develop your style immediately is it's going to take a lot of trial and error. Um, but something that um, I wish I would have known as a beginner writer is, you know, just the organization of, of writing. And not everyone does this. Um, you know, not everyone likes to have like character studies or uh you know outlines they want to just get into the script and that's totally fine you know work do what's best for you but i think some type of creative process um really helps and i feel like when i write too many scripts um if i feel like i'm brain dumping because when jeremy said tinkering i always relate that to the brain dumping process and for me, I find that actually incredibly difficult when I'm trying to just get the idea out on the paper. Um, mm. And I would get eager a lot when I would when I would be designing these stories. I want to get into writing it immediately. But I think um, the most important thing is characters and and like not so much let the world build within the characters and let your characters tell the story. So I think creating like a 
like a very structured writing process is important. I would have to agree with that. In fact, um, my, my process is, is almost, I guess you could say it's almost kind of a blend of that where um, I, I, I initially start out with writing down my idea for the story. And then I, I, I add to that as, as I'm going to it. And eventually I end up with, the, with an outline for the entire story. And then it's a matter of breaking it up into issues. You know uh, what I mean? Like, how mm-hmm. am I go- how am I going to put this together in this in this issue? And I, I will actually I will actually outline um, each each individual comic and stuff. So I'm not I'm not really winging it at all. It's it's all I, I have the whole thing planned out before I dive into it at all. But, but what's yeah. unique about the process there is that while I'm get, writing out my ideas, you know what I mean? Like, if I feel like I, I got an idea for exactly how I want to do this scene, I just write that into the outline there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I have a very similar creative process. And, and if you're stuck on where to go, um, and and you're not the kind of writer that wants to just dive into the script right away, um, you can you can look up tutorials online, you can take workshops in your local area. um, and, And there's nothing wrong with taking workshops, even if you went to school for creative writing university there's nothing wrong with that because like i mentioned earlier aside from being patient writing is like a muscle it's the same with illustration as well um you know you have to build it over time um so definitely you know do anything you can to learn about what you're doing and write you know in my i the way i would do it is is writing your ideas out initially Mm -hmm. first in a brain dump process (laughs) but another thing is bullet point yeah another thing is just you know your comic book you know hopefully you're a comic you're you're a reader of the thing rather as in addition to you know a writer of the thing and i would recommend whenever you see a comic or a story or whatever you're writing and that you really like and and you, you just something about it just clicks with you spend some time deconstructing why did that work Mm-hmm. you know, and, and figure out, you know, can I, can I use some of that uh, fairy dust in my own writing? That's what, what, a- do you, what do you mean when you say deconstructing? Are you talking about deconstructionism? No, I'm just saying take the pieces apart. Yeah. Uh, what he's saying is instead of, um, so you're, you're reading it as a reader, but instead read it as a writer and, and, and observe the way the creator made it work because, There is sort of like, I know exactly what Jeremy's talking about. And it's funny because I only read comics or manga. Like I love comics and manga, but I don't read them every day. I only read them right before I'm getting ready to create a script. Mm -hmm. Not to steal ideas, but to be inspired by the idea. Well, to get you in the right headspace. Yes, exactly. I'll sit there for like a month just binging all my favorite stories. So that's a really good idea. Definitely read a lot of other comics or novels, whatever you're writing, whatever brought you here. Um, just read what you are going to be writing, what you feel you will be writing. Mm-hmm. I, I I think that that work this is definitely true of you should be you should be uh, taking in what you're trying to put out. I agree with that, but I wouldn't say it's limited to that. For instance, um, Basically, any time I'm taking in a story, I'm taking notes on how they do it. I specifically like to go over them more than once. You know, like the first time through it, you're following the story or you're worried if the main character is going to survive or or something like that. But your second and third time through, you can analyze it more. You know the information. So you're like, oh, I see where they planted that seed there. Or I, I liked how they set up this character here or something like that. And that works with movies, comics, novels, whatever. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That makes sense to me. I appreciate that input there. I do have another question to, to, for you guys here, uh, somewhat on along the same lines, but uh, kind of a little bit different as well at the same time. Uh, what is the most challenging part of writing for you and how do you overcome it? Um, I don't work well under deadlines. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I, I, I'm not a pressure writer. Interesting. Um, so, uh, I, I actually like to do things way far ahead uh, of, of the schedule. So like I'm working on things now that won't come out until next year, you know, stuff like that. Uh, like I, I don't, 
I don't. <laughs> I try to. I try to make it a, 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 an inspiration based process. So I try to avoid deadlines if I possibly can. Mm-hmm. Or I'm the worst. <laughs> yeah. I'm the worst. Oh man. Like I have, I have a lot of commissions right now myself. Oh my. <laughs> yeah. One of my clients um, today asked me, like, do you have an update? <laughs> like, yes. Yes. I do actually. I did too. <laughs> That's good. Um, uh, most challenging part. Um, the one of the things that I uh, I think is important to, to know is that the, the some one of the ways that you learn in school to is like you do the research and then you do the writing, right? Mm-hmm. That's not mm-hmm. true. That is not true. <laughs> you, you 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 can do some of the research in advance. You do some, but the, when you start doing the writing, it tells you what you don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, when the trick I have is when where I think, oh, I've got this, and I start going into something, and I realize I don't know that, you know, and then I have to go learn it, you know, and uh, that takes time and, and effort, and uh, sometimes you don't even know exactly what you don't know, and so you kind of have to. <laughs> maybe go talk to people who might know what you don't know, you know, um, and just like the, you got to learn something to n- find out that you don't know something else. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I'm writing a story right now called monkey see monkey don't. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's just a story about, um, you know, a, a young monkey, um, who, uh, can kind of go along with his friends and things get carried away and he gets in trouble and his mom is trying to tell him like, you got to think things through for yourself. Right. Well, the setting is, I, was, I said, well, okay, where, where are monkeys, right? And so I could have said it in Africa. I could have said it in parts of Asia. I decided to set it in Mexico. <laughs> but then I, then I realized huh. I don't know that much about monkeys in, in you know, Mexico and uh, South America. You know, I, I just don't know that mm-hmm. much. Yeah, so then I had, to, I had to go, I was like, what does YouTube have to say? There was some stuff. And then they were like, what, what is there to go read on this? And then I know that we have some friends that live down in Mexico. And I said, Hey, uh, do you have monkeys by where you live? And you know, things like that. Mm, mm. So one piece of research, led, so the research is that what you, you would say is probably one of the most challenging. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, just, things. it's just, you know, cause you need the, in order for it to feel real, in my opinion, um, you know, the, the, at least some of the details have to be right. Uh, not everything, but, you know, you, you, to the extent you can, you try to get it right. And um, so I need to, you know, say, you know, there were these monkeys and they were, you know, in this part of Mexico. And, you know, how do they interact with people? Because the, I was what I was reading is that the, the, these monkeys tend to live in the treetops. And I'm like, well, then why would they interact with people? Right. And that's yeah, they kind of tend to live there, but there's quite a few examples of them coming at least the more mature ones coming down and interacting with people and stealing stuff and getting bananas and things like that so you know there was plenty of stuff to work with when i started looking at it i i have had uh like doing research for Seder, for instance um i was about halfway through the first issue and uh, i came up to a point where like you were saying i came upon something i didn't know and it turns out when I did the research for it, I actually had to change the entire last half of the story because mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like, oh, wait a minute. I, I had this totally wrong. I, I was going in the wrong direction with this. I mean, does that happen to you a lot when you do that? Do you have to actually go back and, and alter your story to fit with your research or, or do you yeah, change the, the research to fit with your story? No, I've, I've had to go back and change things. Absolutely. Um, yeah. You know, because uh, I don't. I'm not going to get everything right, but at least what I know uh, of animals that I'm, you know, obviously I'm anthropomorphizing them in some ways, but when I'm throwing out facts about the animals, I want it, want it to be right. Um, and so, uh, you know, like when I find out, well, that's wrong, then like, well, for instance, in, in growly locks, right. I talked about how bears run really freaking fast. And so you, if they, you see one of them charging for you, you it, you'd be, you know, well served to, you know, I tell it yourself. The, the truth is people who have looked into this say, actually, you want to get out of the way, but you don't want to run um, because that actually triggers them. Um, and so, you know, I'm glad I changed that. And like, I didn't teach a bunch of kids to, to do something that, you <laughs> know, what, what could lead to them being mauled, yeah, you know, that's uh, probably a good thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Man, I, I honestly, I gotta, I gotta say, I, I, I don't, 
I wouldn't want the responsibility of kids learning from what I write. <laughs> I wouldn't want that. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. probably for the best, honestly. <laughs> kids reading uh, my stuff will grow up to be Patrick Bateman. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think the most challenging part of writing um, for me would be uh, remembering my point A to my ending point. Um, and mm. I really try, I feel like the hardest part is making that as less complicated as possible. So definitely my advice in that regard would be to really just keep things simple from point A to point B. But, you know, when you're in the scripts, you can jazz them up. But how you overcome that, I don't know. Please tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Please tell me. Yeah, I mean, the, I, the, one of the things is when you're doing comic books are very specific problem um, mm. because co comic books are an engineering problem as much as anything else. You have a, a maximum number of panels. I don't know what it is, but I mean, like the 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 more you subdivide it, the harder it is to to show things. So, um, you know, typically it's about the, the the average number of panels per page is about five. Um, so, figure out how many pages that's going to be. If it's a twenty page comic, right? Twenty times five, that's a hundred panels to tell your story, yeah. right? And then I, I do want to say I I did did a kind of a tangent, but I just want to sorry to interrupt you, Jeremy. But I just want to yeah. say I, there is a page in barrels that is twelve panels long, so I am yeah. very proud of that. No, page. you you absolutely can do that. I'm just saying that. Oh no, that I know. I'm just being. Yeah. No, I get it. Um, uh, you know, and like the first, I think the first page of the first comic I wrote was nine panels. You know, mm, mm, so like mm, I, I was, mm. it was really more like eight panels because we had a, we used the middle panel to as as a um a credit box so that doesn't count mm. no yeah, um, that's interesting okay but yeah sorry go ahead go ahead with your thought there my apologies yeah but but i'll also um when i'm thinking about working with an artist i i've created this this uh dummy uh script that's pretty vague that i use that i i, I hand to them and it's for six panels right and actually six panels is one of the more difficult things for, for comic book illustrators to pull off because um, it, it's, it's better for the composition for it to be an odd number. Um, and uh, some of them will just change the number on me. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I can see it. it's, it's, I don't, the thing that, that's valuable about it is just how they interpret this to me. Mm -hmm. You know, like I want to see, mm -hmm. I can look at how they're thinking by looking at how they draw this page. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that was, that's a useful tool. Oh, uh, okay. I, yeah. I've noticed with with my artist with Kosen, um, like I, I I will write out I <laughs> my panel descriptions are more like small novels. Okay, so I mean I'm I'm really detailed about <laughs> what I want yeah. in it and exactly <laughs> how the page is supposed to go and everything. And I will hand it over to Tosin. And what's great is we've been working together for so long. We we have this relationship where I can trust him. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I I hand it over to him the the script. And then he will take what I say and he will give me exactly what I asked for, but his interpretation of it. So it's like, you know, I'll, I'll say, I want this in four panels sometimes, or I want this in six panels. And he'll do it in a different amount of panels, but <laughs> still show exactly, exactly what I was He's wanting gone in a better fashion. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, yeah. he'll, he'll, sometimes he'll take, uh, I'll describe an action in a panel and, and he will break it up actually into a couple of panels hmm. to kind of show oh, a wow. movement through them yeah. yeah you know stuff like that and i i just i, just, I don't know i just had to but, brag about my artist there for a minute you should <laughs> Bra brag about your artist any chance you get uh doug curtis who i worked with on movie man is awesome paula ritchie who's been is doing the, the first four kids books is a, is a great artist to work with mm. and and just a real treat um absolutely um the Famously, um, you I assume you've seen the, the script to Watchmen, right? No, okay. The first Moore's description for the first panel <laughs> was 800 words long. What, yeah, oh my and, god. And, and, and there's this great, there's this great bit where you know, like, because I don't know how they transmitted these notes, but but they you famously then have Dave Gibbons underlining like two sentences. <laughs> in it and being like, okay, that's what I can use. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, dude, that's wild. Done. Well, Alan Moore is uh, notoriously wordy, so that's yeah, no, surprising. Co Colleen Duran um, said the first time she got an Alan Moore script, she cried. 
<laughs> That's so awesome. I, actually, <laughs> I, I I am a bit wordy because I'm highly influenced by Moore in his writing. <laughs> Specifically, the the saga of the swamp thing mm, uh, was really inspiring mm, for me. Mm, uh, but after going that. through Watchmen uh, recently, I mean, damn, I got some ideas. <laughs> oh, I bet, man. <laughs> honest though even illustrating my own comics now i'm still wordy like even with really my... yes hmm. oh, oh wow that's like, interesting. i yeah. want everything to i'm a perfectionist so i want to make sure that like because i feel like um creativity for me is very spiritual and when i'm in this like in that zone where i'm just really concentrating and really everything's making sense and my hmm. flow's going great that when I have an idea in those moments, I don't want to forget it because it's important. So I even still illustrating my own comics now and still wordy with myself because with my creative process, I'm not going to see that finalized script again until it goes through um, another editing process before we create um, the, the actual storyboarding. So it's like definitely... <laughs> Don't feel bad about being wordy because your story is important. However, you have to get it across. So I, I am personally, I mean, I, I've actually heard, I had a guy actually tell me that I should write comics and set up my Kickstarters for people who hate to read. And I just <laughs> disagree with that. Uh, you know what I mean? I, I, I personally write comics as a balance of the art and the words, not uh, strictly art with just a few words to make it make sense. That's not how I write comics. No, it's both. You know, comics yeah. is both in. Um, I, I would say that uh, we've we've had this debate before previously, so I don't want to reiterate it. But um, that I, I I think though that artists or sorry writers need to think more in terms of even if there's not words on that page, I still directed what was supposed to be there. You know, right. um, so you know you can have a completely wordless page that that a, a writer wrote and that it wouldn't have taken the form it did without your direction. But, but, but that doesn't mean it always translates to words. You know, no. you bring up an interesting point there. Um, when I write comics, I actually, I kind of consider myself a director, like how, how a director would, would run a movie. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm talking about the, I describe the camera angles, what I want in it. You know what I mean? Like it's, mm -hmm. it's, I'm, I'm, like like Jeremy's saying there, like uh, we, we're 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 literally directing a movie on page there. Yeah, it, I mean that's all comics really are. They're just uh, illustrated movies, really. Well, movies a lot of times a, a big early part of the process in movies is storyboarding, and right. comic book paneling and storyboarding are very similar. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I'm actually um, since I've been illustrating my own comics, I feel like that's my gonna be just my favorite. I'm so excited! I can't wait. And and Matt, uh, what's uh, what are some of your you know things that you've um, you know found the most difficult, and how did you did you overcome it? Uh, probably the most difficult would be promotions. <laughs> mm, no, I'm just kidding. That. It's, <laughs> oh, it's, no, you're just kidding. It's <laughs> more me too. Yeah, me too. It's more along the lines of figuring out. How to set the scene? How many pages you want the scene to be? How many panels you want the pages to have? And figuring out how to make it flow well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you look at a lot of, I've looked at a lot of scripts from well-known players, you know, such as. Neil Gaiman, the aforementioned Alan Moore. They've got script bits that are about, well, they're probably novels themselves. <laughs> the, yeah, I, I, could, I could imagine that. Yeah. Yeah, I bet, I bet Neil Gaiman's quite the same. I, you know, that's a, you know, that's a, he's one of my favorite authors for sure. Uh, but I think that's, a, you know, that, the point you bring up there kind of brings us nicely into my next question. Mm -hmm. which is um, how do you balance creativity and structure in your writing process? I have uh, to eat Scribner. <laughs> I will never stop talking about the Scribner. 
<laughs> yeah, sure, sure, Mike. Uh, so what I mean is, um, how how do you balance the creative side of your writing with the more structured process of telling a story? I, I guess in my mind, they're they they they're both the same process. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what you mean. I I don't think I understand what you're saying. Uh, well, are you are you basically talking about the story versus the the form the story takes? Right, like you, your creativity could be like uh, how just kind of put into perspective. Like your if your creativity is like it can be anything, right? You can I can make the president uh, fly to the moon on a unicorn rocket ship with David Bowie, but okay. the structure to that story, you know, is there any kind of why? I think a, I think a, a lot of work a, answer. You know, sorry, Matt, sorry, Matt, go ahead. I've got a one word answer that outline. Yes. Outline. Prisoner <laughs> really, like, it's just a fancy term for uh, uh, outline. You know, um, I like some, like I said, there are just some writers that like to go on in, and, and that's fine if you can keep, you know, them mental notes, but some people can't. So I would recommend, um, you know, oh man, just an outline that gets you from point A to the point B. And I feel like um, a good starting point, um, if you're writing a big story, that is, is knowing your ending first. Mm -hmm. I feel like knowing your yeah. ending first really builds the rest because the hardest thing is the start, is the first chapter, is the first whatever you call it, uh, episode, whatever. Mm -hmm. what, that first entrance is hard, but but knowing your ending makes it so much easier. So I would say outlining till you know your ending would That's definitely really help. I like that. Yeah. Mark, yeah. Mark, I, I, Mark, I know it's pronounced Miller, but it's spelled Millar. So I'm going to call him Mark <laughs> Millar. Um, <clears throat> that Scottish bastard. Um, <laughs> he he um, uh, he always writes his ending first, uh, uh, and then engineers toward it. And I didn't know that trick when I started, but I, I very read that he did that. And so th that that helps you get over the engineering problem where you where you know exactly what you're aiming at. Um, then it helps you navigate better. Yeah, um, that is that's how I figured Swebin. That's why I always when I when I was writing Swebin, I found it so much easier than when I wrote Starring because Starring has a lot of elements and it got very overwhelming for me, like the world building this, that, everything. Like, don't even think about that right away. Just think about that ending. That's such a great piece of advice. Well, excellent. Yeah. Just... I don't. Oh, Sorry, you, you talk. I'm listening. Oh, well, I have another question here, unless you wanted to add another point to that here. Oh, I was just I... going to say that some of us aren't outliners per se. But that doesn't mean that, that our head isn't doing that. Um, and I do find that sometimes I have to back up. And uh, another trick I've learned is when you get stuck, then, then just literally just say, on this page, this happens, you know, and then make it happen. Um, uh, or you can, you, can do it at any, you can do it at any granular level. You can say in this comic, this happens. You can say in this miniseries, this happens, you know, and then just break it down to, you know, the, the actions. And then... Once you have the actions, the it, it as the organizational principle, then everything falls into place. I I actually created the omen verse in reverse, like you're talking about. I pictured an ending uh, mm -hmm. back in 2014, 2015. Uh, there was that uh, tetrad of blood moons, and everybody was talking about how it was the end times and the apocalypse was coming. And I started imagining this this concept of well, what if apocalypses from various uh, mythologies and beliefs all happened at the same time. And I, I kind of imagined a world where that was happening in, and I just kind of worked my way back. I kind of about oh, to the middle and that, <laughs> that allowed me, now you that allowed me. me to build. Yeah. You literally, <laughs> you literally started with the end. Yeah. So yeah, I got, I got, I, I got to break out my Idris Elba here. I'm sorry. We are canceling the apocalypse. Right. Yeah, really? <laughs> Seriously though. <laughs> oh man, you gotta love that. that some I just saw man. <laughs> but that that's interesting. I, that's a good way. That's a good way to look at it. Going from the end to the beginning, because it's like if you want to go somewhere, you have to know where you're going first. You can't just start walking and and hope to get somewhere meaningful. I mean, maybe you can, 
but for most people you have to have a destination in mind right yeah yes absolutely and and a little another little fun thing just to add in here i'm sure it's going to be brought up but something really cool that i like to do is always foreshadow my ending in the first chapter Mm -hmm. oh yeah Um, that's interesting i've actually i've actually had that not work out for me uh oh no uh, (laughs) critic wise i foreshadowed the ending in Seder, and that was that was the one complaint i got from anybody that really yeah was that he he showed what he's i i started with uh uh, a scene close to the end in the beginning of it uh, to foreshadow what was happening. And uh, because everybody saw that, they said that that ruined the entire comic well, you gotta uh, because be of that one scene. Very yeah, I guess is it like a, a balancing act in a way? Yeah, there's yeah. some balance when it comes to that. Like, you don't want to, like, throw it in their face, but you want to just, you know, peekaboo. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Uh, no, it it wasn't what? it wasn't a scene that like uh told the entire ending and, and it wasn't even yeah. the ending in and of itself. But the fact that I said something about the ending was the one real critical response that I got about the comic. Yeah, but I mean that was one was it one person or multiple people? Uh it was three different people. Okay, well then that might matter. Yeah, the other question, were they in a cabal together? <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. Actually, there's this worldwide conspiracy against me. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay, there we go. There I, we go. I only <laughs> believe in the vast and all-encompassing conspiracy <laughs> to piss me off. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, well, at the same that's... time, at the same time, in Watchmen, they do foreshadow things about the end uh, throughout the throughout the issues. But it's it's really it's really carefully done. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, like um, when they're putting out that fallout sign, there's also a poster of the missing writer, Max Shea, to the right that you don't even notice if you're not like analyzing the whole the whole panel there. There, there are ways to do it. I, I'm just suggesting, I guess, the way I did it that particular time uh, did not work out for me. Sometimes it doesn't. So that's a kind of a I was going to go with a different question, but that one kind of segues nicely into one of my later questions I was going to ask, which is how do you handle feedback or criticism on your writing? I listen. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, it, 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 I kind of, I, I take it in and I, I try to find uh, uh, things that I can improve on uh, that, that I agree with. I mean, there are some, there are some just creative differences. Like uh, there are some ways that I just like to do things and that's how I'm going to do them regardless of the critical response. Uh, but, but when, when someone gives me analysis, like what they said with Seder there, that I, I know now that I, I need to be more careful there with, with how I plant those things in, in the beginning or whatever. But like I said, I usually start with the end of a story. So yeah. <laughs> just telling the story wise, that's almost where I want to go. But I mean, it, it's all a matter of, of picking like, like my grandpa used to say, you chew up the straw and you spit out the sticks. There you go. I was going <laughs> to say, I was going to say you plant in the future, plant a mustard seed or plant mustard seeds rather than watermelon seeds. Yeah. What, wait, what? What does that mean? Sorry, because so the mustard seed, mustard seed is the smaller. smallest seed in the world. But it also oh, really? has a huge effect eventually. Oh, wow. Okay. That one's a thinker. Read your Bible, Mike. Damn. Damn. <laughs> uh, I'm exposing myself live on air. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was funny. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Well, that makes sense. That makes sense to me. That, that one's a pretty, pretty straightforward one. Um, what about. Uh, how can beginning writers find inspiration? How do you overcome writer's block or lack of inspiration? Um, uh, go. I get inspired by all the stories I consume. Mm. Honestly, uh, it. I love. That's one of the reasons I. I love movies and I love stories. I, I love analyzing them and picking them apart and finding out why they did things and stuff like that. That's where a lot of my inspiration from. Um, I actually have a strange thing I do for writer's block, and this may or may not work for everyone. Um, I get the, I have an idea. I have my idea for the story and I actually walk in a circle, uh, and, uh, over and over again. And, and I try to go through the, through the plot of the story every couple of times I go around in that circle. And I, I don't, I don't know what it is about the, the, the walking and the thinking about it, but eventually it things actually start to, I start to think in almost a circular fashion and it, it really helps. Yeah. It, it really helps me kind of organize my thoughts that way. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's, um, Socrates, for instance, would, he'd do his philosophy while he was walking, you know, um, 
It's not like the idea of like you have to just sit still to think. That's not always true. Um, mm. But I, I would also say that that yes, obviously, read great books, read shitty books, read, read, read. What you know, uh, culture. There, there, but d- you will get it, it, uh, open yourself up to inspiration in places that you wouldn't think of this coming from. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, the there was this uh, attempt to like knock over a nightclub, right? And um, there was this one guy who just gave no f's, and he was just sitting at the counter, and they were trying to mess with him, and he, you know, he was like messing with his phone, and these guys had machine guns, and he just didn't care. Um, and and they finally just left him alone and left. Mm. Um, they they did get some money or whatever, but not from him. No, wow. and and I'm like, I want to, you know, and at some point, I don't, I haven't done it yet, but I'm like, I want to tell the story of that guy, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like what, what's what's the, you know, what's the situation in life that right? people are putting oozes <laughs> in his face, and he's like, I don't care, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, there's a story there, but exactly, that's an, I see what you mean. It's like the inspiration came from an unlikely source, you know, or like la- last night I was uh, with my uh, family and we were, and I was walking back with my daughter from, we'd uh, gone and gotten dinner and then we went to a park and my kids kind of wedding crashed um, in the sense that they, that they, there was like this, I don't an event center that was connected to this park and the wedding party had some toys and my kids just decided to go play with the toys and we didn't <laughs> stop them because nobody in the party was. Um but anyways, uh, decided to, you know, we, I wanted to see if we, I could get her back uh, not too much past her bedtime. And so I promised to take her to Barnes & Noble. Um, but anyways, on the way back, uh, we were trying to dodge seagulls overhead because we didn't want to get crapped on, right? Like Yoda? <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, exactly like Yoda. Um, and uh, we look up on the roof and, and, and she's, she, a couple of the seagulls are – they're not flying. They're they're on the roof and they're kind of moving in a weird way. And and uh, she goes, they're dancing, Daddy. And I, I just instantly in my head the idea of Harry the dancing seagull, uh, <laughs> you know, formed. And I'll probably tell that story. You know, mm-hmm. um, like That's don't be another one in the story book line. You know, yeah, exactly. Don't narrow. Like you can get inspiration anywhere. And I mean anywhere. You like uh, Martin Luther wrote theology while he was on the John. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> not saying it was great theology. It ain't, it's saying he was inspired. It ain't, um, nothing's off the table. <laughs> you know, like it's the world is is a vast inspiration, and do not ignore it. Mm, mm. I definitely have to agree with that. Mm. Um, I get inspired by all kinds of things. Um, and the way I overcome writer's block is, I don't know. I haven't got, I I haven't even had it in a really long time, to be honest, since I've had a lot of creative control. I felt like when I was really in a creative box, I felt like I would get it quite frequently. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to fix this problem for you once and for all. You ready? Yes. Okay. When you get blocked writing something, write something else. Hmm. That's what Stephen Um, King does. But but like I said, I don't really hmm. I don't really get it much these days because, like I said, I felt like you know look at what's blocking you out. I feel like that's another good thing. Like look at what's blocking you out. Figure out the source of the problem. There's also like uh, other things you can do. Like a a big part of writer's block is losing focus. So if like you feel like you're losing focus, go do something else for an hour or two. Yeah. Come back later, um, or. Don't forget about the magical substance known as coffee. Yeah. Coffee. Yes. <laughs> like, I, I literally wrote a story called The Coffee Monster recently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I Let feel me like... Guess. Oh, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, you're fine. I feel like you definitely can get inspired by things around you. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, I'm, I'm definitely like uh, the type of writer that is like, if you made me mad... You're in probably my story somewhere. somewhere. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> I get tired by everything. Yeah. <laughs> as, as, as Jeffrey Chaucer said in A Knight's Tale, I will immortalize you in fiction. No, no, no. <laughs> there you go, yeah. <laughs> but if you write a story about somebody you're mad about, how do you do it later? You'll get busted. Yeah, no, I, I don't mean just <laughs> Write about the people you love, too. Write about the people mm. that 
care about, you know, when you, when you get intimate with your writing and, and not saying that you always have to be that way with it, like, you know, all serious constantly, but if your story calls for it, it's a good piece of advice. Like, you know, find what your story calls for and fix the problem, whether that be watching something or reading something, whatever, whatever works best for you, just do it. Yeah. And there, there are multiple causes of writer's block. One I will point out is that there you're you have conscious thought processes and you have subconscious thought processes and i think i pronounced that all correctly maybe um and uh sometimes your subconscious is saying no 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 no, that doesn't work but it doesn't it it doesn't work it, the subconscious is not a verbal thing um and so it can take you a while to realize that's what's going on okay yeah, that, make, that makes a lot of sense, actually. And, and Matt, um, do you ever face uh, any kind of uh, writer's block or lack of inspiration? What, is, what have you done to try and get over it, if you have? Yeah, basically, it's it's right over things, such as if I were to lose creative focus on something fictional, I'll just go and watch a movie and try to write a review of that. Okay, okay, so you, you take inspiration from the things that you watch and read. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I, I, will, I will add this for any horror writers that happen to be listening. Um, uh, how, how do I say that exactly? Um, stick to what scares you. If you are not afraid, you are not going to scare your readers. Yeah. The, the, there's a similar thing, um, you know. He's, I know he's sort of infamous right now, but Scott Adams um, had a very bit, good bit of advice for um, writing humor. He goes, "Humor is physically funny, so if you just go, that's clever, whatever, doesn't that's nice. But if you actually, if you, if you're, you hear this and you, you are, there's some physical reaction, then that's funny." Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we got horror. We've got comedy. Yeah. What about uh, drama? Do, do you mean? Do you mean? Um, do, do you mean like uh, <laughs> you, you? You don't just. You don't just. You don't just tell a joke and show them like smiling or something. You would show them uh, like physically moving or, or reacting or bent over laughing or or something along those. Is that what you're talking about? What I'm saying is when you're telling a joke, if you don't actually find the if, if, if you just think, oh, if you say, I think this joke is funny, but you're not actually physically reacting to this joke in mm -hmm. some way, like mm -hmm. maybe you're smiling about it or something, then <laughs> it's, it's like, probably not a funny joke. So I just thought of the funniest. I, I just thought of the funniest joke here. Yeah. I'm going to write it down. This is the it's like, dude, you're not even laughing, though. You're not even. I thought, I, I thought you were applying that to writing. Uh, that's but I, I think he is. I think he is. Like he's saying, like, if your writing isn't making, I think if I could boil it, it down, if your writing isn't making you laugh, it probably won't make someone else laugh. Yeah. Correct. You know? Okay. It makes okay. sense to me. Yeah. For sure. Cause I mean, I'm not a comedian for sure, but um, I feel like uh, if you're trying to create a serious um, story, um, you know, honestly, it just comes down to style. Um, you're going to mm. realize as you write, you're going to have a style. Um, and, and especially in like serious, more dramatic stories, don't do things just for the shock factor of it all. Um, well, unless you're telling horror. Unless, yeah. well, this is more of like a drama, like drama, bad type thing. Um, Cause some people will just throw in like these shock things like, Oh, like, for example, this character had a traumatic past and mm -hmm. like, don't overwhelm the readers with all of these depressing things to prove that the character went through something. I feel like um, in serious things like that, where we get into backstory and stuff, it's just important to create one event that the character went through that changed them and how did it change them and what did the character do? So it, you got to let your characters in, in more of a serious tone story, tell your story. Uh, your characters are very important. I feel in a lot of stories though, in all genres. The characters are the story. Yes, exactly. Um, and something, a real cool technique that I learned um, 
from for getting to know your characters and bear with me it sounds corny but it worked mm. um is is interviewing your characters huh. um, it create a set of questions and ask your character sit down and just talk with your character and answer but you know you are the character so you have to get in character it's it really helps and i really also feel like knowing um a little psychology also helps when in more serious dra- drama themes Oh, so like Mike was doing earlier, talking to his mic self. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, <laughs> Getting to myself as an author. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this I'm te- sorry, I had to throw that in there. <laughs> this technique is actually how I um, I designed my main two protagonists in Sweden, actually. Mm, okay. Yeah. I like that, yeah. I'm going to have to sit down with uh, Tommy here and do a little interrogation. Uh, Tommy, <laughs> feel the beans. What do you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> are you going like to get that. a hot lamp and everything? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Dark room, yeah. hot lamp. Knowing right your character's motion in the air is really important. Mm. So, yeah. I mean, it makes a lot of sense, right? It, you know, every, every good character <laughs> has to have a motivation. Yeah. I actually mm. learned it from Abby Emmons. Huh. In her in her writing workshop. Oh really? Yeah. Oh wow. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. Um, and and I also follow a lot of um the way that her her writing style, the way she executes it. I I also use that as well because my my uh like I said, my comic Sweven is a little bit more on the drama, you know, romance, dark, sad stuff. So um, I definitely use that a lot because my characters, the reasons are for sad things, why they're doing what they're doing. So. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Well, yes. Uh, moving things along here. I got uh, plenty of great questions for you, by the way, I appreciate everyone's answers tonight. They've been really insightful and hopefully everyone out there listening is getting some good advice on, on things and taking notes as well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, let's see here. I'd like to go with what are some of the common mistakes that beginning writers make? Um, I, I, I actually, I, I, I will admit this. Um, I honestly wish that I, I, I don't think I got really any, any good <laughs> at writing comics until about my fourth book. I mean, my, my first three comics are, are okay, but but the the skill level was just not there. I honestly wish that I had taken the time to write a few comics out before I tried publishing my first book. And as a lot of people, I've I've talked to people about this. Um, they get so antsy about wanting to publish their first book that they don't take the time uh, to do that to to build up their skill before they put stuff out there. And I I would just recommend. That, that that people do that. Um, I look back on my first couple of books and I'm kind of cringy about it. You know, like I, I, I feel like I feel like that people are gonna read my initial books and they're gonna be like, well, this isn't all that great. So why should I read the rest of it? Hmm. And what I mean, you know what I mean? Like that that I I just don't want anybody else to go through that. Yeah, but if look at like I mean to switch it up, put the other foot. Look at people look artists, right? You you look at like early Todd McFarlane, you know, it's not nearly as good as it later became, you know. Oh no! They're, your they're, your they're, first book's not going to be the best. It's you just know, accepting. <laughs> you know, it's it's uh, you know you might be quite good, but you're you know if you're not getting better, there's something wrong. Oh, for sure. Not saying that everyone sucks at the first time, and you should be right or no. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah. Obviously, you have some creative drive. So right there, that should tell you um, that you're in the right place. <laughs> right. And- you know. Oh, sorry, I just want to throw this out there. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, I think that was a great quote. I just, I, I just met Spencer uh, from who does the Pizza Boys comic. I met him at the convention the other day, mm-hmm. and yeah. he said, he put it in a great way, which is he said, if "There's something punk rock about it. Just getting out there and doing your comic the way you want to do it." You know? Oh mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Punk rock yeah. is the ultimate DIY. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the balance is, um, and again, I'm in a different market right now. Where, you know, I'm doing kids' books. Um, you know, there's also a right to market aspect of it. You know, like if I, if I decided to pepper this full of f bombs, um, th- I could understand why parents would not like that and wouldn't, would you know, uh, rate my comic badly and or rate, sorry, rate my kids' book badly and it wouldn't sell. Um, you know, like you gotta genre matters and 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 
genre and market are very they're related um absolutely and uh yeah so like don't you should be innovating within what the thing is rather than outside of the thing i, I guess i would say um I, there's that um another one is uh and we're gonna disagree <laughs> me and mike are gonna disagree on this one um but uh the uh uh i really think that don't don't be too wordy in your first, you know, when, when you're out of the gate, try, try to keep it minimalist. And if you want to expand over time, great. But I would just, as a uh, discipline, I would encourage you to try to, to not be crazily wordy uh, with your first efforts. And by the way, this includes me. I <laughs> did something insane for the, the beginning of this one book where I wrote 12 or 1300 words of prose. And uh, we just decided to space that out over five pages as, uh, you know, uh, through caption boxes. And uh, that was not a good idea. Five pages? Wow. Jesus, so. man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Amanda. I just saw Amanda's comment in the chat. Thank oh, you. Oh, yeah. Hi, Nick. Hi, everyone. I I, I see no comments. Oh, oh thank you. Go. Yes, great. She, uh, Amanda says, great panel, everyone. Yeah, uh, thank you. Amanda, I, I love your last name. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Got to get her on an art panel. There you go. Oh, <laughs> oh I know who this is. Uh, I know who that is, I think. <laughs> I, I think. I, howdy doodle to you. <laughs> I just I just want to mm. say, as far as the, as far as the wording goes, um, I actually modeled uh, how, how I set things up uh, based on what Alan Moore was told when he was writing Saga of the Swamp Thing. Okay. It, was a, it was about uh, a certain amount of words per page total mm -hmm. and then a certain amount of words per balloon yeah. uh, mm -hmm. and per panel, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Totally, uh, and totally. and I, I, is, I figure as long as I'm landing within that, uh, that I'm, I'm doing all right. <laughs> I, I would just consider that the upper, upper bound. I would just say that, right? you know. Like, don't go over that. <laughs> it's like uh, they say in Pirates of the Caribbean. It's not exactly rules. It's more like guidelines. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my favorite line in, the, in Pirates of the Caribbean is where um, Johnny Depp keeps getting slapped. And he goes, I probably deserve that. And then finally he goes, I'm not sure I deserve that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a classic. <laughs> or as Deadpool uh, says, uh, maybe not the nethers. <laughs> 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 oh man that's funny but uh now matt uh what about you i i always uh, you know i want to get you chime in on this one here too this is uh you know a, a important one i think are you with us matt yep uh, i'm here yeah so what, what are some of the common mistakes that that, that you feel that may, you've seen beginner writers make Well, I think the biggest problem is they put too much of themselves into the character. There's the, the main character, so that whenever there's some kind of criticism about it, about the character in the story, it feels like to them that you're criticizing them. I feel like that, like, I feel like I agree. Like, I feel like a lot of first beginner writers do that. They like, admittedly, I, I do that um, in some way, but I don't overwhelm, um, overwhelm, especially because you don't want to get into doing that and then have to, like, write other characters and you'll end up making everyone sound like you. So it's good to step into different mindsets, different perspectives um, when creating characters. And, and I feel like a, a big common mistake is not realizing how important your characters are. Um, they are seriously just the most important. They are the blood, the vessels, the guts of your story, essentially. Um, and I just, another big thing is when people say, they won't notice. Yes. <laughs> yes, they will. They will always notice. <laughs> I say that. Like, like the other day, like I was, I was, <laughs> I had an eye, like even in art, like even in art, um, I had an eyeball like off and I just could not get this eye mm. in with the other side. And <laughs> someone said, they'll know, they won't even notice. Yes, they will notice. And you're going to wish 
you fix that issue. So don't, don't, you know, think like people won't notice because they're going to read it and they're going to pick it apart too. So mm-hmm. uh, I just want to, I just want to throw this out there and, and I, I, I don't even know how many people are into this kind of thing, but I will say that I have gotten a lot better at characters and, and understanding my characters uh, since I started playing like Dungeons and Dragons and Call of Cthulhu, uh, <laughs> working on these characters in these RPG games that they really set it up so that you really have to fully understand your character mm-hmm. uh, to play them. And it, it's, I, I would just recommend that uh, as far as it, it's a, it's a great way to to really uh, understand building up characters and and who they are and stuff their backgrounds exactly. their goals their desires all that kind of stuff. Because then they're going to sound mo- if they don't have complexity, they're going to start sounding monotone. Yeah, like just not three dimensional human beings. They're human beings, so they're going to think and act like a human being, even in a fictional world. Because that's what makes your writing realistic is when your characters are three dimensional. Period. Mm. <laughs> three dimensional characters. So <laughs> I, I think I think that even even I, I I don't I don't know if this would work as well, but I think maybe even just role playing, you know, in your own house by yourself or or whatever. Exactly. It doesn't even necessarily have to be in in a game necessarily, but. But, but I did, just random plug, I did see a Call of Cthulhu scenario designed for one player, like the, one keeper. So, like the, right? kind of. <laughs> the same concept role playing, just be right? the doer and talk to your characters, get to know them. Even yeah. just the stupid details matter, like it moves the story along. Like, that's interesting. Yeah. Like, okay, for example, oh, this is just off the top of my head. So, Tim walks out and it's sunny, but Tim likes the moon. So why is he in the sun? Stuff of that. Like, wouldn't it sound so much better if he was in a setting at the beginning of the story in which means something later means something to him? Yeah. Those little details matter. You know, especially um, in visual media like comics. There is a scene in uh, Lethal Weapon One. I don't know if you guys have seen the movie. I I assume you have. Yeah, but when when uh, Riggs and Murtaugh are in the are in the uh, what do you call it the uh, the shooting range, and they're talking about they're talking about the murder, and they're going back and forth and putting things together. Uh, that scene is doing multiple things at once with their dialogue. That they're both they're both working on the case themselves, but they're also bonding there. And there's also the whole thing of them being in the shooting range. The setting itself has something to say. If you, it, I, I invite you to analyze that scene at some point. That that was just brilliantly written, and I think it's exactly what what uh, Nika is talking about there. Yeah, well, that's also a great. You know, like uh, there's the talky part of comics. You know, and that that's what you mentioning there. Doing it in a shooting range. Is, is a great way of uh, making it more interesting to, to uh, viewers in that case, but readers yeah. in I hope case of comic book readers. <laughs> I would imagine that a great resource uh, for kind of go bouncing off of Michael's comment would be, or yeah, Mike's comment would be to uh, watch like a com- like your favorite director's commentary tracks. I bet that'd be a great way to get insight into how they did things and maybe can give you an insight on how to do things for your story too, like the symbolism the meaning and all that kind of stuff i love symbolism that's my fave mm. <laughs> dramatic dark theme tones that i prefer to write in <laughs> mm, totally yeah i'm a depressing writer <laughs> <laughs> you know oh, i <laughs> i got i got a little something out of like for instance i wrote dragon girl a vinyl warrior which is nothing like anything i've ever written mm. um yeah all of my characters i usually write are dark broken Usually murderous people. <laughs> and I, 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 when I, when I, when I wrote Dragon Girl Albina Warrior, I was talking about two genuinely good people. And I just, my point is, I think you should try to write outside of your comfort zone too. Try to stretch your boundaries. I think that it, I think that it makes both better. Yeah. No, both end. <clears throat> write what you know and stretch. Yeah. That's awesome, yeah. Um, hmm, okay. And uh, in that case, uh, what are some of the best resources or tools that you can use to improve your writing skills? Uh, reading. 
Yeah, I think we covered that kind of. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. With the reading the comics and stuff. And what about in terms of like um, any kind of uh, technology tools or any oh, any, yeah. any kind of equipment well, or anything that, that helps you? You can do it in so well, many I'd, different ways. I'd say one of the things that you could do is just observe people. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but don't let them catch you, you staring at them. <laughs> Well, yeah, I think another part of the problem with recent stories is that there are so many people who don't observe real people who don't pick up on social cues very well due to the fact that a lot of us are addicted to social media. Mm -hmm. Uh, guilty as charged (laughs) i think it's safe to say to just take a workshop um you know like i said earlier the the podcast it's it it is so important writing is a muscle and it's only going to get stronger and bigger if you provide it to be so so hell yeah taking workshops like uh even just doing stuff online like youtube talking looking at other writers and their techniques finding a technique a style um and and you want to develop that as you go you want people to open the book in the future how many books you have out and always know that it's you you want to i will just say that having a having a best friend that taught graduate level writing has been helping me a lot yeah yeah (laughs) you know always be open to feedback I'll always look for tricks tricks or or even creating beta readers um i know some people don't like doing that but um for me personally i do i like to kind of have just a group of people outside of you know cause and myself reading what what we're doing um mm-hmm. along the way mm-hmm. the the I, one I, of the chief one of the chief things that helps if you can get several people reading it is you can get at least a slightly better idea of how what 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 a what the reception is going to be like among people who aren't knee deep in this story. You know, that, that, that actually brings up an important point. Um, I really think that editors are a necessity. Um, I think that you absolutely need like one, one, I have, I, I have se- uh, uh, several friends that make comics as well. So we tend to read each other's scripts. So that helps. But I, I, I really think having fresh eyes on the book uh, is important. And I, I will tell you that uh, getting an editor for me, uh, help me see things that I wouldn't even have thought of. Uh, things like I say things, and in my head it means this, but he's like, "Well, I read it, and it means this." <laughs> you know, right. like uh, st- stuff like that. I, I, I would just personally recommend an editor. I think they're very valuable and worth the money. Absolutely, absolutely, I agree. Um, I've been working alongside my editor since about 2019, um, and it it has only helped me. Um, it only helped me and he and he allows me my creative freedom he don't change things he don't change things he just either provides feedback to help me along the way or he'll you know jazz it up a little bit and i always take his inputs in because it still sounds like me right right it still do, has do you my do this, style do you do i i do this thing sometimes where like um, after I've, I've done my draft of the book, you know, you, you want to go over it like 20 times before you hand it to the editor. You're like, no, it's got to be perfect. Right. Right. But what I've noticed, I do this thing, though, where um, in my head, I know what I meant to say or I know how I was going to write it. And so sometimes I read over it just like what it was in my head. And that's not actually what I wrote there. Does that does that happen to anybody else? Your, or is your, bra- your brain is an editor. Um, yeah. It's, it's actually, what, you know, I, again, day job, I do professional editing. Um, uh, you can only look at a manuscript so many times before you're going to just miss a ton of stuff because your your brain will fix it, if, if even if it hasn't been fixed on the page. Ah, uh, it's not just me then. Thank you. No, <laughs> it, it's, it's a fairly universal human trait. Okay. I try to observe too long, though. I try not to sit there and stare all for like a month on end, like, you got to come to some finalizing point. You look. What you're trying to do is to get your manuscript to what you feel is an overall state of I'm going to call doneness. 
Yes, um, right. And then send it off to somebody else who will look at it and 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 help evaluate it. That could be an editor. It could be a peer, etc. My method is more about being cheap, really. I want to make sure it's as perfect as I can get it before I have to pay my editor to look at it. <laughs> yeah. one, of, one of the things I'll do when I'm writing these kids' books is I have social media. You know, I'll just throw uh, the first draft of the story out there, and then people can pick at it if they want. Right. And so in that way, do you use it to get, like, feedback from, from people yeah. and... Okay. Yeah, they'll say you missed, you know, you screwed this up or this fact is wrong or whatever. Mm. Um, and uh, th- it's not often that I get that, but it does have power happen. of the people. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's just you got more eyes on it than just yours. Yeah, that can, I can imagine that can often be a big, big important piece because you, you looking at it all the time, you might miss something the others see. Yeah. yeah. Also, I've noticed with the flow of the story and even uh, like how the story comes across. Uh, can be different uh, in my it, it, like like kind of like Jeremy's talking about there like how your how your head wants to edit it but you see this complete story in your mind and so like when I re- when I read through it I, I feel like it came across a certain way because I'm catching up on all I'm catching all the little points that I yeah. laid down but it, it doesn't necessarily come across as as fluidly as it might uh, to us. Well, the thing in your mind is the Platonic form, right? At least that's one way of thinking of this uh-huh. and. And what you're what you're doing is an approximation of that. Oh wow! Um, I don't that's entirely really buy that, but that that's okay. that's. <laughs> I think uh, now that's the idea of the cave allegory. Is that right? Uh, well, specifically, Plato said that like uh, uh, so the table, right? It's mm. uh, you know, oh, there right, are right, right. there are ver- variations on what a table is, but it's it's based on a like, the idea of a table, right? Of a table, you know, that, like yeah, I there is from, there is a yeah. perfect table, at least in theory. Yeah, you know? oh yeah, 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 yeah. I remember it, the picking. I did a philosophy class in college, and it's kind of ringing some bells here. Yeah. <laughs> so um, um, I interesting. Okay. I my I you know. For me, it's more iterative. It's more mm. I, I'm throwing stuff out there and I'm I'm changing it as I go. And and mm. I have a broad idea that I I wanted to conform to usually um, that uh, doesn't usually completely change. But um, yeah, it's it's just because I've been doing the editing thing for so long. I I, I see the seams and things rather than the whole. A lot of times. So you have you've done editing as well in addition to to your own writing. Yeah, I mean, for the last 20 some odd years, we'll say. Wow. Um, I mean, I literally, when I was in college, I was, I was editing a, a, a national uh, publication out of my dorm room. I had like CEOs of companies calling me up and yelling <laughs> about edits. Wow, um, that's wild. Hey, if you're looking for a job, I know, um, uh, I remember a number of years back, I saw uh, uh, like um, uh, some of the manga companies were looking for editors. And yeah. I was like, man, I wish I was an editor. I would go work there. <laughs> <laughs> No, I've, I've got a pretty decent day job. Okay, fair um, enough. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I, I've edited. You know, I've, I've been published in thousands of publications, or, or more than a thousand publications. Um, wow. I lost tra- track. Um, but mm-hmm. uh, by I've edited a, a, you know, a multiple of that in terms of articles and books and as you know, uh, reports and whatever. And so. Then in that case, this I think this is a good segue into our next topic, which was you can kind of touch on this as a, an editor's perspective, but everyone can also talk about it from a writer's perspective. How does a writer develop their own unique voice? You know, how how does I one love that question? Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> um. So this is what I my advice to how you can do that. Um. And you need to ask yourself, why are you writing this, and what is the truth? that you want to scream to everyone. Um, you know, this can really fall under the, again, the more su- like dramatic genre. Um, like what, what is something that, I mean, I feel like it could fall under any genre, but I only started asking myself that question in Sweden. Um, so what, what is it that I want to say and how do I get it out there? So you need to figure out what it is you're writing and why you are writing it and whatever that reason is that is and that's going to be the reason that carries you through mm. i mean mm. i guess the the but part there's also discovery along the way you know i mean the you might have an idea a vague notion of the thing 
and you're creating it so you can understand it better. Okay, I, I can see that. There's like a, it's like sure. two sides of the same coin in a way. Yeah, well, you can you can still even if there are people who have multiple reasons, you're still gonna find the answer to that along the way. Um, and I feel like having a driving force really keeps the writer's block away as well, because if there's something that you eagerly um, want to say and get out there in your own unique voice. Um, you're going to need a driving force. And something that always carried me along is why. Why am I writing this? What's the reason? Mm -hmm. um, you, you, when, you, when, you, when you, like, for instance, um, I, I write because I have stories inside of me that are eating at me until I get them published. Yeah, they're not. Like, I, I, I have to I have to get these out there. It would literally That's be like a horror it would be a horror story. Like your your head would be devoured by <laughs> the stories inside of it, right? It, it would. Whoa. It would. Um so I mean that that's why I made that's I mean not to mention making comics is just addicting on its own. And and but, that's you don't really have to have like this deep rooted you know, like real art, like whatever it is that you want to do is what drives you. Now, for me, something that I do is I think of in this story in particular that's in front of me that I'm currently doing. What is it that I want my what is it that I'm saying? What is the message I'm trying to make? Yeah. Um, but I also get deep in symbolism. That's just my creative writing style. So I think it just comes down to style, too. Yeah, I think I think I came up with that on in in after after the the after it really I I kind of discovered with my story like with the Omen verse that there is there seems to be this overall theme of redemption in the story, but I yeah. I didn't start out with that theme. Yeah, well, I mean, it, probably because it was a subconscious thing. Yeah. Um, Could be, Could you know, be. The, that sort of bubbled up because um, you know when you think you think at different levels. Um, the, but to, to go to your what you're talking about, um, I wrote um, Growly Locks, which was the first book in the series, um, because I hate golden mean arguments. Um, and, and so that book is just me ridiculing golden mean arguments the, all the way through. Sorry, um, in, in for those who don't know, I mean, obviously I know what it is, but for those who don't. Like yeah, you... no, it, it's the idea that the truth is a mean between two extremes, right? That's not, okay, th there are, are certain experiences that sort of bear this out in, in the sense that like if you're in the shower you don't want it too hot or too cold I get that but um, th often when you're making arguments uh -huh. a, an argument isn't true or false based on it being a mean between two extremes it's, it's true mm -hmm. or false based on other factors um, and I hate golden mean arguments and so that had been just percolating you know through me for years and so finally I sat down and I wrote a children's book about why this is stupid um, my this is not this one was inspired by my father-in-law who uh raised pigs when he was a, a child right and as a farmer mm -hmm. and he talked about how awful pigs are and so like i i, I flipped the script of the you know the three little pigs and basically the point of this is you know pigs can be awful too um, <laughs> right They're, it's not all flip the script stuff and what i'm doing but yeah there, there's something i'm playing with um like some notion that uh kind of drives it forward so mm -hmm. um but that's not that's usually the case but then there are and and I'll, I'll give you an example of a comic book that i've written and has been illustrated and one of these days we'll get it out there um uh where it is a little bit more of a message comic um and it's called mega humans go to war and it's a comic about why about how not why war is stupid mm -hmm. Um, and it, I, what I, I'm not making a moral judgment when I say that. It's just the things that you hope to accomplish with war often do not come out nearly the way you wanted them to. And um, even in a successful war, a lot of stuff can go pear-shaped very quickly and uh, uh, you know, can be kind of a pyrrhic victory rather than an actual victory. Um, and so that would be a larger theme in that series. Um, uh, but it's not a message comic, but it, 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 it is informed by my view that um, wars often go very, very, very badly um, for all parties. Mm -hmm. how, how do you how do you how do you balance that line between um, I'm giving you this very obvious message, but but please don't take it like I'm preaching at you. 
Well, in the, in the case of that one, it, it's I'm telling small stories within a larger world, right? Right. Um, and so I just focus on the the and again, I don't know if this will be successful in the long term. Um, but um, the so the, there's the overall arc, but then within it, there's just smaller things that are happening, and you're seeing how things are going to crap, basically. Um, uh, that looked like it was going to be a slam dunk, and that didn't. That's not how that worked, you know. Um, you mean like it's more? It's more like um, observations the reader might pick up rather yeah, than well, right out in front of them. Sure. I mean, but the basically it's the whole Mike Tyson saying that you know everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. You know, uh, everybody has a plan marching into war until people start shooting back at you. You know, um, it then the plan has to change. No plan um, survives contact with the enemy. Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't you could agree or disagree with me with a, with a larger point, And it still would be an interesting uh, story to navigate, hopefully. I, I I I apologize. I sound like I'm arguing. I I no, analyze hey, everything by breaking it down. So I, I, I'm just trying to understand. I, I never. <laughs> you never have to apologize to me for arguing with me. Okay. <laughs> never. Mike did put out a really funny tweet the other day that I think was something, something along the lines of my my concentrating face is very similar to my upset face, and I'm thinking yeah yeah my when I when I'm yeah the look on my face when I'm thinking and the look on my face when I'm irritated are almost exactly the same. So you have resting pissed off face. <laughs> I do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's uh, so that that could put part of it too, perhaps I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Uh, <laughs> Well, that's a good point. And those are some good tips on, you know, how developing your own unique voice um, and, and whatnot there. Uh, Matt, or Jeremy, did you have another thought on there? It looked well, like you, I, you had the, when it comes to voice, I, I wouldn't worry that much about voice. Tell your story. Oh, really? Tell your story. Tell the story you want to tell. Um, tell it as best you can. <laughs> Focus on those things. And I think your voice will emerge from it. Mm, mm. Okay. Be yeah, you. that makes a lot of sense, actually. No matter what, be you. Mm. <laughs> don't try to be somebody else unless you're unless don't you're a serial unless unless you're a serial killer then don't be you so the only time not to be you is when you're a serial killer or you're a ghost writer got it <laughs> i've been one of those sometimes things. serial killers <laughs> you decide which <laughs> <laughs> oh man <laughs> uh, uh, that's good okay <laughs> What does um, it say that I end up discussing serial killers at some point on almost every podcast? I think I think you're obsessed. <laughs> <laughs> it can't it never fails, man, no matter what podcast you go on. You know? <laughs> it's, complete, it's completely unrelated, yet somehow you managed to figure it in. Yeah. I had I had a former roommate that said she said I, I eat eat cereal for breakfast every morning. Does that mean I'm a I'm a serial monogamist? <laughs> I like that. That's again. I got to get in your uh, your five minute uh, yeah. set here, Jeremy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we got to get you on the stage at some point. I know. Yeah. I got to get this out of my system. <laughs> uh, okay, gotta, well, that's... Go ahead. You, you no, no, no. Go ahead. I please tell me. No, it's it's all right. I've 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 uh, seen shoot enough here. What what do you got to say? I was gonna say. I thought maybe we were going to avail us of one of your anecdotes of uh, comedic tales of your. Well, I, I I will say that I go back to Washington D.C. You know, and and, uh, and not infrequently. And so, some point, I'm gonna I'm gonna open up a set by saying that I just flew back from Washington D.C. and boy, is my ass tired. Just flew back from Washington D.C. and boy, is my ass tired. I love it. <laughs> you got to do it, man. You got to do it. <laughs> Well, so you know, the, from sitting in the seat for that long, obviously. Yeah. Well, obviously. <laughs> um, so yes, uh, how are we feeling on time, guys? Uh, are you know I, we've been doing this for about an hour and forty minutes. Are you guys feeling okay right now? I'm, I'm going to have to wrap it pretty quick here, just because okay. we don't have air conditioning here, and I'm starting oh, to melt. God. Oh boy. Yeah. Okay. Well, I we can uh, do a few more questions if that's okay with you guys. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Uh, and yeah. then we can start wrapping up here. Yeah. Uh, I. I obviously have one on the screen here. Okay. Um, this one's probably not by really playing Call of Cthulhu. <laughs> You're probably not. But yes, how can, how can writers stay sane and healthy while working on their writing projects? Don't neglect your body. Um, mm. That's that's uh, you know 
you'll get so wrapped up, or at least I will get so wrapped up in something that you just focus and like I've had back spasms because of this before. I I, I once did did a project where I had to I, I pushed the deadline far further than anyone should ever push a deadline. And then finally had to get a book done, a book. Um, and within a 24 hour space, I compiled 15,000 words. Um, and for the next two days, my back, my forearms, my hands, my neck was hurt. like, I literally was like running my hands, or my arms under the water um, to just try to like calm them down and, Whoa. and stop the pain. Dang. So, um, that's intense. Don't do what I did. <laughs> uh, don't try this at home kids. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I've been through a similar situation. Um, and I definitely say like creating a schedule, um, is very important. Um, sometimes I go off the track a little bit, uh, but you know, just trying to stay as consistent as possible, devoting, like, you know, just some time to writing throughout the day and, you know, letting it be that, you know, don't try to force yourself too much. Um, you know, meet your deadlines as you find fit, but definitely don't eat, drink water. Make sure you get up at least if you're sitting there for hours on end, at least get up once an hour because that could lead to a lot of issues if you don't. Anyone else got uh, any I, uh, tips on seeing I, I, I personally, um, I, I'm kind of a workaholic. Uh -huh. um, I basically worked from the time I got up to the time I went to bed for about five years. And um, it, it wore me right the hell out. And um, I, I, I went... What I've had to do recently is set hours for myself uh, during a day. Oh, wow. Like, um, no matter what, you're going to stop at this point. Uh, because, like you said, I, I, I have a really bad neck. And sitting at my computer, looking at my monitor, it just eats at that really, really bad. And so, I mean, uh, it definitely, definitely do that. It is not worth it is not worth what you're putting your body through. Uh, it, it's especially if you keep pushing that when it hurts, stop. <laughs> you know yeah, what I the mean? Other, like, the other thing is, you if you push too hard, you'll get sick, and then, or at least a lot of us will. I will. Um, and then you, the, you know, you're out of commission for a while, and and then it wasn't worth the push. Okay. Matt, do yeah. you uh, have any ideas on how to stay sane, or do you just uh, try to, you know, just go ahead and go full insane and let, you know, let the chips <laughs> fall? In? No, I'm just kidding. Well, being a writer, you technically are insane to be in That's true. Go. I mean, you, that's that is a good point. You, you're, you're not wrong. <laughs> we all go a little mad sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, it's, it's reason. It's one reason why I still uh, still work up. Huh? a job with food service because it's not as much hell as retail and I get to do so get to be active so I don't have to deal with any kind of body issues. Hmm. That's smart. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you know, uh, like Mike, Mike said, don't play Call of Cthulhu. That definitely won't help with the. <laughs> that will not help keep you sane, <laughs> not in the game or out of it. You just go nuts. Let me tell you. I, I think <laughs> anything related to HP Lovecraft won't keep you sane. Yeah, I'm sure his oh, advice right. for for writing would probably be a little different. You know, like embrace the insanity. You know? <laughs> just <laughs> Use hug, it. Hug Fuel the, it. Hug the ancient ones. Embrace That's oblivion right. or something. I don't know. <laughs> Stare into the abyss. Like I pointed out the other day, madness is the emergency exit. If we don't use that, how do we get out? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, yes, uh, I just have a few more here. Um, what is the most important thing you've learned as a writer? Not to be too cute. <laughs> or, I, 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 okay, too cute is probably not the right way to describe that. I, when I was writing my first book, I went back and I read a bunch of stuff I'd read, I, I'd written up to that point. So I read the last, let's call it a hundred articles. I don't know what the actual number was. Um, and I hated it. And I just said, like, I, this writing style is awful. Um, it, it's self-important. It, 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 it's, it is not, 
what I think it will actually communicate with readers. I don't know how I've been getting away with this, but I need to change that. <laughs> um, and so okay. I just changed the way that I wrote um, and uh, stripped it down and made it as simple as I could. Um, and it, it, it helped immensely um, with uh, the rest of my career. Like if I hadn't done that and done a reevaluation and been willing to really change uh, how I did what I did, um, you know, I, I don't think I would have been a success. Wow. That's, that's interesting. So really taking a look at what you've done before and evaluating it. Yeah. Like what is working here? What's not, mm -hmm. you know, take the good, leave the bad. Mm. Yeah. Okay. I think the most important thing um, that I've learned is that I have creative freedom creative freedom in what you're doing is so important um making sure that everyone is on board with the creator you know that really is important you know you're the person who's in charge you're the one that's calling everything at the end of the day so if you're not happy with how things are going and you're scared you know because of the opinion of others like at the end of the day you can take that criticism and you can you know, implement it in a way that's still your creative freedom. Um, you don't have to take all criticism to heart. Um, and, you know, definitely keep working on that, on that for sure. Creative freedom is so important to me now uh, than it ever used to be. So I, I'm glad I realized what that is. I, 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 I feel like, I feel like I should also point this out. This is kind of like with the with the previous question, but um, as as far as as far as criticism goes, um, it's really important how you view that. Um, I mean, when someone shows you how you can improve, that is not a bad thing. That is a good thing. Yeah, it shouldn't it shouldn't be looked at as a personal attack on you it is actually i mean look at look at it for what it is um it is a, it is a way of helping you to point out things where maybe you could strengthen yourself in this area or or change things a little bit in this area um a lot of a lot of writers i've heard they get some like some they get a review and the person didn't like their book and they they just freak out about it like i it, it seems like they uh, people want to take that as a personal attack on them and and that is not really what it is Criticism is just information that, that, that yeah. it's then you take and sort as, as the way that will most benefit you. Yeah. Again, yeah. fuel it for your, your own purposes, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Use it as the inspiration to, to do, you know, keep going in a way. Yeah. Indeed. Hmm. I think we just lost someone. Yeah. And I could just, there was a second version of her and then there was no version of her. And now there's, now she's gone. Hopefully so, she'll so, jump back in here before we in here. No, but no I, more clones. <laughs> I don't know. I think uh, there could be a third clone. Uh, I okay. did. I did see Netflix just put out that movie. Uh, they clone Tyrone. So it, it's okay. possible <laughs> we'll be dealing with a, with a clone okay. Tyrone situation here. <laughs> well, that might be a, a good indicator for I'm the rest of us. Now. to. Yeah. Well, I did actually have one final question okay. if anybody doesn't, you know, for the remaining people to answer here, which is what is your best advice for new and aspiring writers? Okay. Yeah. I, I've got a good one for that. Um, good. Look, over time, you're, there's a general upward curve to your, um, you know, what you make and what you can, I don't, in both in terms of money and in terms of, um, you know, quantity, uh, quality, you know, like it should all, those things should go up. But you start from zero, and it is a long, long slug um, for the vast majority of people. I mean, sometimes lightning strikes, but don't count on that. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're going to do this, it's a long haul, and don't do this. If, if, if you think, oh, I'm going to do this, and I'll become famous, and, you know, uh, that's not the way to do it. That's not, that's not, that's mm -hmm. a bad, you're, you're setting yourself up for failure. Um, yep. and don't do that. Um, you know, like you just have to realize you're starting from zero and you're, you're climbing a very, very tall mountain here. And not to get discouraged. Uh, right. Yeah. Hmm. 
but know what you're getting into. It sounds like. Well, well, I mean, you know, or, or get discouraged. I mean, uh, the, I, I think, yeah. you know, but like get discouraged for the right reasons, you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. get discouraged because your writing isn't doing what it should be doing and fix it, you know, mm -hmm. get, get discouraged because um, you're, you're not making as much money as you want to be making and then figure out ways to do that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like th there's nothing Complacency wrong. Complacency is the enemy. Yeah. I mean, there's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with, with being discouraged, but then, but realize that this is a, it's a mechanical problem. Okay. Yeah. Well, excellent. Well, thank thank you, Jeremy. I appreciate that. Sure. I I'm actually gonna have to go. Can I? Yeah. Just... No worries. Uh, where where can people find you online and and everything? Jeremylot.com. J e r e m y l o t t dot com. Buy my new book, The Three Feral Pigs and the Vegan Wolf. You'll love it. Your kids will love it. Your grandkids will love it. Uh, just you'll love it. So. Um, uh thanks for having me on guys and we look forward to doing this hey, uh, again soon thank you man i appreciate it and one last thing before you go it looks like neo star just want to say it's been a while jeremy i'm happy to hear you're doing well neo you're awesome thank you mm -hmm. thank you again jeremy you have a great night you too bye for now bye, bye. and so yeah uh on this final topic here did uh, anyone else want to go ahead and, and give their best advice um I guess I could give the same advice I would give to almost everything. Leave it all in the ring. Don't hold back and 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 leave a situation so that later on you're like, you know, maybe if I would have just do it all. Don't don't hold back. Leave it all in the ring. Make sure all of the fight you had in you was left in there. Hmm. I see what you mean. Yeah. I'd say don't look at, at social media as being the real world. <laughs> don't let them control your stories. Hmm. That's all. I think that's a valuable piece of advice that uh, people oh, will yeah. often forget. <laughs> so often it can seem like that's the whole world right there, but but you are right. <laughs> mm, too true. Too true. <laughs> and then Neostar uh, actually said, uh, "Well said, Omen Comics." So uh, Neostar. Um, Oh, thank you up on man. that one thank there you. as well. Nika, did uh, you may have missed the question, but um, oh. we were asking, what is your best advice for new and aspiring writers? Oh, sorry, I was talking and my mic was muted. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> <laughs> I was having some. I was You're like, what's going on? Why isn't anyone? That was solid here? gold, man. <laughs> 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 um. So I guess uh, the best advice i would give is to stay patient like i said earlier um remember that your characters tell the story and that it's not corny to talk to them like they're real people um but no i'm just kidding <laughs> just, you know be, be very patient with yourself um and what you're doing um you know remember that your creative freedom and voice is the most important thing about writing and that is what you know you got to find that reason that's going to be your guiding force period that's excellent well thank yeah. you so much i think that's a really great piece of advice and i think it's a great way to wrap up our second writers beginning writers workshop i think everyone has had some really great things to say tonight so i really appreciate everyone's input and it's just been really fun and um so as we wrap up here why don't we tell everybody where people can find you online so we can make sure we can check out all of the stuff that you've got going on and all of that good stuff uh, you um, can find oh, you sorry. can find Omen Comics um, at Omen Comics on Twitter and Revelation Comics at at Revelation Comic. And actually, a little heads up: the only place, the only place you can buy physical copies of our comics is at the Wicked Store, and they're five dollars mm -hmm. plus shipping. Check it out. And you can get that. I believe that is uh, wickedpublishing.net slash Wicked Store. Yeah, sorry, I don't know the I don't know the actual address. It's, okay. it's just uh, on my toolbar, so I just <laughs> let me just double check, make sure that link works. And yep, that's it. Doesn't <laughs> it crashed my computer? Oh god! No, uh, so yeah, that's the wicked w uh, www.wickedpublishing.net slash Wicked Store, and you can go check out all the comics, uh, including um, the Kenny Chronicles, Omen Comics, Revelations, and soon Star Ring as well. Yay! Yeah, yeah. I'm so excited. Yeah, yeah. I know, I right? I'm so ready. It's gonna be so good. I know. Oh, Finally, it's gonna be very nice. Yeah, it's gonna be. It's gonna be really satisfying to get that one out to people. I think people are gonna really be excited about that one. So, 
Um, for the record, patience is a virtue, Neo Star. You are uh, right. Yes. Oh yes. <laughs> Great piece of advice here as well from the chat. And um Yes, this is the best patience. <laughs> <laughs> and not just the song off of GNR Lies. But we can include that as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but that is also awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and then, Matt, what about you? Where can people check out uh, your stuff online? You can find me at, at Matt's friend on Twitter. You can find McKinnon Chronicles on Wicked, Wicked Publishing's websites. And for anything else that's related to the Mythoverse, there, there's the Mythoverse pu on Patreon. Mythoverse Patreon. Let me get the link there for you real quick. Up on the screen. There we are. Patreon.com slash Mythoverse Comics. Excellent. Thank you. And... Uh, Finally, oh, we've got Nika. Where can people follow you online? Um, so right now, uh, you can just follow me on Twitter, uh, Monochrome Nika, spelled as it is. Um, and also uh, keep in, keep the lookout for uh, Starring, which is getting released with Wicked coming soon. And I'm adding uh, additional pages um, in the back. And I want to nice. do, I want to possibly do a Monochrome poster. Yeah, nice. it's monochrome Nika on Twitter. Yes. I'll get that on the screen for you. Yes. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. And uh, I appreciate you, you jumping on here with us. Everyone was, I really had a lot of fun tonight. Um, this is really, really interesting. And I, I think we built on the first one that we did and, and we're able to, you know, go some new places that we didn't get to in the first one. I know. It definitely was very fun. Excellent. Well, thank you guys for joining us again. And if you guys are watching live, we really appreciate all the, comments in the chat uh we've got neo star saying looking forward to star ring Woohoo! yeah thank and you also, yes that's gonna be fun and the mythoverse lives as well so that's yes, exciting yeah. stuff yep. and, uh, i can't wait i'm so ready i know right star ring has been a long time in the making and and so we're really excited to see that one i know um, and i gotta say i'm real excited to like isn't it just amazing that the last pages in the book are illustrated by me Whoa, like, that is pretty just, cool. It's kind of like bringing your artist journey full circle from where, you know, your writing journey began to now your artist journey. So that is really yeah. cool to see. Yeah, it's a great comic. I can't wait to put mm. it, put the new, put the new version of it together too. It's going to be mm. good. Yes. Excellent. Well, thank you again, everyone. And if you're watching on the replay, we appreciate you and everyone have a great night we'll hopefully do another one of these soon uh this is actually really awesome so maybe we, we can not wait so long between <laughs> or yeah and we'll do another one soon here sounds great really excellent awesome guys we'll take care everyone have a great yeah. night we'll see bye you bye. next time you